Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, theater, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert, and it is Halloween. It's been Halloween in my household for two months now, as you might be able to guess. I've had Halloween decorations up since September, or the beginning of September, and I love everything about Halloween, and I've been extremely busy. It also happens to be professionally and otherwise the busiest month of the year for me, and so, and and uh, life in the pandemic has only made things busier for some reason, and so I've been extremely busy, and every moment that I'm away from projects or work, I'm just cons- in constant Halloween celebration, a Halloween party every single night in some way, shape, or form. And I, uh, getting down to the end of the month, having only released one podcast during the, during October, and I thought, I'll just leave it at that, but then a goblin was biting at me, saying, you can't, you, you can't do that to the people. You have to offer them at least, if nothing else, a really quick, informal, fun Halloween episode. Because it's Halloween and it's the Monster Professor. So, okay. Here we go. I'm going to just solo here, run through some random Halloween viewing for your pleasure to check stuff out. Um, Some of this stuff is entirely new. It only came out in the past month or so, so this could be like... Halloween viewing 2020 some recommendations from the monster professor but also there are so many other cool things that are retro movies Halloween horror movies or some things that aren't so retro but I've revisited recently and so I'll just mix all those in tell you what's cool on the newest things I'll keep the spoilers to a minimum if you want to completely avoid recommendations and spoilers move on to the, some other episode at some point in the future because that's all that's happened now so I want to talk about What to watch when you have your big Halloween party tray or your stew or your roast vegetables and your Cornish hen or you just eat pumpkin. I don't know what you do, but you have your big Halloween meal. You have a nice Halloween drink. You sit down. You want to watch something cool. Well, here's some cool new things that are out right now. Hulu's been doing some cool stuff. One of those is an anthology series called Monsterland. Um, it looks like Mary Laws put that together. Uh, Mary Laws being a screenwriter, um, her name's familiar to me from some excellent work she did on a TV show based on a comic book. Preacher is the name of both of those. Maybe we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and she based this series uh, that she created on a book of short stories, North American Lake Monsters, uh, by Nathan. I'm going to screw up your last name if you're listening to this. Bollinger. Uh, I like the, that pronunciation, so I'm going to stick with that until you correct me otherwise. Um, and truth is, I haven't read this, uh, this book of short stories, but I'm going to now because... This uh, anthology series based on it is really cool. I um, don't want to really offer any sort of negative criticisms if I don't like episodes. So instead, what I will do is tell you the awesome episodes to watch. So here are the episodes that the Monster Professor says you should check out if you want to check out Monsterland. I think it's only airing on Hulu. Um, episode one, go ahead and start with that. Uh, it takes place in this, uh, little, I don't know, little weird, uh, kind of impoverished suburb around New Orleans, it seems. Um, I'm sure I'm getting the geography wrong on that, but that's at least the feel of it. And that episode is a nice introduction to what they're doing. They give you this, this, uh, really well done, uh, 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 let's see, gritty, realistic, um, kind of quotidian existence of people uh, living hard scrabble lives in the real world and trying to like 
pull double shifts and make ends meet and take care of kids who don't want to be taken care of and all sorts of things. And and it's beautifully shot. Uh, the sound, the visuals, the pacing, the script, everything's really nice. That first one is great in character. Each one of these episodes features a monster. And in Monster Land, um, they play with what I like to call the horror reverse, which is sooner or later you realize the monster, if nothing else, at least is what it is. The monster is true to itself and or the monster knows what it is. The problem comes with the human beings who are sometimes more monstrous than the monster. But I think part of what in the kind of ethos or the moral background of these kinds of stories, uh, it relies something on that the human beings don't qu can't quite figure out what it is that they are. We can't quite figure out what our nature is. And because we keep vacillating between good and evil, because we keep being unsure of what we are, because we can't make the right decisions or even the decisions for ourselves, we end up very often being more despicable than the monsters themselves, who, if nothing else, they do what they do. They live fully in their nature. And there is some, t there is something in us, at least when we see that in stories, that tells us, at least, if nothing else, that is right to be what you are fully and <laughs> completely, even if you're a monster, rather than being a monster and trying to pretend like you're not or trying to make other people think that you're not. Um, and so you see that kind of thing happening in this first episode. Uh, we get, a, we, let's call it a skinwalker type of monster that, uh, that wanders into this um, quite fascinating and well-written world of this single mom dealing with um, a psychotic child and may, perhaps not a psychotic child. I'm sure the very generous, more clinically minded people would have a, a much nicer name for it. Seems like a psycho kid to me and unsure about what to do about it. Um, it's pretty, it's a pretty good episode. And I say you might as well start there. And then episode two, absolutely fantastic. It gets an A, maybe A minus. I'm quite picky on giving up my grades on TV episodes, but man, this is good. So you get a shadow person in this one, in the life of this extremely convincing, uh, disturbed young man. Um, I think I think this actor that they found for episode two, Eugene Oregon is the title of episode two on Monsterland. I think he might be the reincarnation of Crispin Glover or something like that. And his house is haunted by a shadow person. And then you get this sense of seeing what happens when um, an angst-ridden, uh, angry, kind of helpless young man who has this violence boiling up in, in him, um, how he responds to having a monster that may or may not be magically making his life worse and worse. It, you know, you could at any point start seeing clear metaphors to I don't know, school shooters or perhaps over the over militarization of American politics or something like that. Or you could sit back and enjoy it as an awesome monster movie. Um, and again, all of these episodes play with the horror reverse, but it's so absolutely well done. Um, that one, I think I might have edged into spoiling too much. Maybe I'll back off on the next one. Let me just run through all these. Uh, how about episode go ahead and you can go ahead and just skip to episode five of Monsterland, Plainfield, Illinois. This thing, here's all I'll say about this thing. It might very well win the unofficial monster screen monster award from the monster professor podcast as featuring the best zombie on screen I've seen all year, maybe the past couple of years. It is, it is absolutely brilliant what they do with, uh, with seeing, seeing what 
seeing things from the monster monster's perspective it's not just like uh the, a good zombie makeup wise or a good zombie shot well although it is those things it's seeing the world from a zombie like if you're a zombie all you want to do is just be dead if you're trying to find your true nature and the humans don't let things find their true nature they we want to control things and make things better against their own will and uh, and i think this is something unlike episode two that you see a, a kind of stranger and more surprising perhaps um, metaphorical moral behind uh, this, these ideas of, say, darkness, suicide, depression, it's, it's pretty surprising. And this zombie's absolutely fantastic, so much so that you might be surprised that I even use the word zombie. Uh, check that one out. So episode one, two, five, and six. Go to six, and uh, it will probably be no surprise in this one that you have a mermaid on her way into the episode but it is a fantastically done mermaid. And it plays with that idea that we've talked about in previous episodes of mermaids and sirens um, having through folklore, history, mythology, culture, literature for the longest time, they were the same kind of thing. They were this uh, magical aquatic witch that sometimes was part fish sometimes had the ability to lure you with sound or lure you with hallucination to your own doom again all of this is nested in this very real down-to-earth working class blue collar kind of calloused hand lifestyle of people just trying to make ends meet and trying to figure out what is up with themselves in their own lives and then in comes the monster uh not necessarily as only a catalyst because the monster has a direct effect on everything um but it still alters uh lives in so many cool ways and this this mermaid is fantastic maybe she gets the second <laughs> best screen monster award unofficially from the monster professor in the past year as say if we're going classic universal monsters like you know like dracula and gill man and <laughs> mummy and invisible man and zombie or something like that then this one gets the best creature from the black lagoon award <laughs> i don't know the uh, lighthouse uh film uh that film uh the follow-up um david or not dave edgar's um uh, edgar's i'm blanking on his first name his follow-up to his excellent film the witch uh, made a film called The Lighthouse that very briefly featured a mermaid. This one uh, episode is all about that mermaid. So check that one out. So Monsterland, watch episode 1, 2, 5, and 6. You might dig the other ones. Those are absolutely my favorites. Okay, so let's stick with let's stick with Hulu ever so briefly. Let me throw another thing at you to watch uh, to enjoy this Halloween. So check out Bite Sized Halloween uh, on Hulu. It's a short film series. And I don't know how they went about it, but it looks like they just sent the word out to a whole bunch of indie directors saying, give us a two to four minute Halloween episode of anything or a two to four minute Halloween movie or something. And they stick to that, man. That I don't think any of them is, it gets much longer than maybe four and a half minutes and just one after the other some of them are extremely well done and tell an expansive story in like two three minutes it's a beautiful kind of experiment to see as a storyteller whether you're a storyteller through just words or visuals or both to see what kinds of things that they can create um and if you don't like one just wait two minutes and it'll be over and we'll go to the next one it's really fun some of and they and because there seemed to be no assignment for these directors other than just tell a Halloween story, tell a horror story. Uh, because of that, you can get a whole range of styles, everything from funny to absurd to deeply terrifying to 
per, I don't know, socially poignant if you're looking for that. Um, all sorts of really cool different styles mixed all together in one, one after the other. Um, and I think it's something, uh, it says something about, say, horror structure, or the type of stories that we tell when we tell horror st stories. And you've heard me talk about this before. If you've attended any of my, say, guest lectures or any of my events um, in which I speak to horror structure or to monsters in literature or what what have you you've heard me talk about how horror structure works even beyond just the genre of horror stories um, and I very often oppose that to quest structure and or the hero's journey structure and I think quest and hero's journey takes a lot longer to tell a story that feels complete and horror doesn't have to you can tell a complete horror story in a very short amount of space it's why I argue in in well essentially one of my projects and a book I'm working on <laughs> about how horror structure works in stories whether it's whether it's film or novel or short story um, it's why so many literary short stories actually use horror structure it's because you can handle the whole story in a short space as opposed to a more uh, quest adventure kind of story that normally takes at least a full say movie or a, a full novel or something like that um, so let, let's just close that up. Say go check out Bite Size Halloween. I won't tell you what episodes are the best ones to watch because they're all so short. You might as well just watch them all and support these indie filmmakers doing some cool stuff on Halloween. Let's take a jump to a retro horror or Halloween movie. One that I had never seen before this month. Um, and I am embarrassed to admit it. And in fact, if you're a fan of this, uh, if you're a fan of this 1986 film, uh, this brilliant 1986 film, and you're finding that out that the monster professor had never seen this before, what's wrong with him? I am embarrassed. You're probably already screaming at them at whatever platform you listen to this on. You're screaming into YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts. That, what's wrong with you? How could you have never seen Night of the Creeps? But I hadn't. I don't know. I don't know how I missed that. And, I mean, the director of the creator, director, writer, uh, writer, director, everything, the guy behind it, Fred Decker, he also made uh, a movie that was basically the script for my life my entire early childhood and then i guess my teenage years and my adult years monster squad from the 1980s uh i think the year after none of the creeps came out i think he was working on monster squad while he made this because at one point graffiti in the bathroom in the background of one scenes uh has something written on the wall saying go monster squad which had not existed yet um, you know, uh, other than that, that TV show from the seventies, which doesn't count as the monster squad. I'm talking about the brilliant film, but I'm not, I'm not going to go and use this episode for the great Halloween movies that I always watch or that, that, uh, really affected me through the years. Just stuff that are that that's new. That's new to me. That's stuff that I've never talked about before because I've never seen it. Night of the Creeps is absolutely freaking brilliant. It's hilarious. It has wonderful acting. Um, it's everything you want out of these cheesy B movie horror things from say the 1950s, 1960s. It's a it's a deep homage to that kind of genre. And in fact, it starts out in in the 1950s, shot in a beautiful black and white and I have to admit some disappointment when that part of the film is over and it switches to modern 1986 Technicolor and modern and 80s music um, you could I get over it quite quickly but it was no surprise to find out later that um, director and creator Fred Decker wanted the entire thing shot in black and white I think that I think the production company kind of over uh, overrided him on that one um, and just because they were trying to make some 
they were trying to make money in 86 and people weren't into watching black and white films in the theater but it should have been that um and i think he got the slide and the version i saw was the director's cut version of the ending which was much a much better kind of homage to this i don't know ed wood era b movie <laughs> thing going on um it's it's like i said it's it's there are creepy moments there are fun moments there are funny moments uh one of the great surprises of it are the characters um i should back off and talk about what the what night of the creeps is okay so essentially slugs from space uh jump into your body through your mouth and turn you into a zombie or they if you're living then they'll go into your mouth and like lay eggs in your brain and kill you and turn you into a zombie under their control and all you seem to do is just attack and other people and spread the slugs to them so everybody turns into zombies so it has what it has like alien invasion stuff it has it's a zombie movie it's a slug monster movie all that kind of stuff the plot of the movie almost makes sense for a while unless you pay attention and you find out it makes no sense whatsoever at all uh the slugs also jump into long dead bodies as well and it's not just that like what happens and who knows what and why people are doing what they're doing makes no sense it actually doesn't tie together but that doesn't matter because the characters are so good the actors are absolutely fantastic and in um you know it seems like for a while you're just watching a cheesy 80s horror movie if that's what you want that's what it gives you um and that's great and everything but the the first turning point is when uh the friend of our main character and if i'm remembering correctly our main character's last name is romero as in george romero um the the uh the uh there's another oh i think the friend's name was carpenter and hooper from the uh, you know john carpenter the director and hooper a uh, horror film director I think the main girl was Cronenberg, horror director. Um, there, I think there were others. There's a Landis in there, a Raimi. Somebody was named Sergeant Raimi, as in Sam Raimi. And so it's just, uh, oh, <laughs> and the university. So if, if all, this, all these events happen around these fraternities and sororities at a university. And... Um, and the university is Corman University, as in Roger Corman, the great B-movie horror director, uh, who also was kind of mentor and teacher to so many great directors, from Joe Dante to great actors like Jack Nicholson, and really got them in the business. Um, he created, essentially, the phenom that is Dick Miller. And... Um, so so it's it's this fun tongue in, tongue in cheek homage but it plays on all sorts of levels like night of the creeps now it's like creeps as in the creepy crawlies the monsters that slink around in the shadows but also in 1986 you would call people who are terrible uh all right how about this maybe the worst stereotype of a frat boy well, we might nicely we might call them jerks. I think it's more common in in 2020 to call people douches or something like that. But they used to call them creeps in the 90s, like you creep. And all the, and the largest segment of uh, people who get turned into these slug brain zombies are a whole, is this whole fraternity who are a bunch of creeps. And so you have Night of the Creeps being these guys were creeps anyway before they turned into zombies, and then the creeps turn them into creep zombies. And so you and so you get essentially moments where uh you got these these two kids and they're in their formal ga a, a formal gown and formal tux about ready to go to some college ball or gala uh or they're with a with a shotgun and a flamethrower blasting uh zombie frat boys <laughs> so these are the kind of nice moments you get but uh you have some surprising turns with characters it's going along like a regular cheesy movie and then fr this friend if i remember correctly jc um and he has the two walkers to help him out because he has problems with his legs uh 
uh, and, and he's kind of like he has a Jerry Lewis kind of comedy role in this. But very quickly, I don't know, 15 minutes into the movie, he's kind of fed up with being a sidekick who gets dumped on from this kind of cowardly friend that he's connected to. And then he just talks through the movie and lays it all out about what he's fed up with and why uh, what he's involved with is a bunch of bullshit and he's pissed off at his friend and 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 so, like this is this is real authentic true human emotion coming through in the 86 night of the creeps what's going on here and that keeps happening through the movie and in fact jc has a nut a nut well i won't spoil the whole thing for you um because there are Man, there are um, Tom Atkins is the main detective. He has this really moving backstory. He has moments like that, and where he has these these monologues that are that are worthy of screenwriting awards. I think they just happen to be shuffled into a movie that doesn't seem as brilliant as it actually is. Um, and so. Uh, Maybe I've talked enough about Night of the Creeps. I hope I've convinced you to check it out. If you already knew it and you were like a cult fanatic about it, then I have joined you. I have become a creep to join you with the Night of the Creeps. You know what? Let me let me just stick with embarrassing myself and tell you another movie that I only watched in the past month or so and I've never seen before. Although many of you might already be cult fans of it. Critters? The original Critters movie, apparently maybe I had seen Critters 2 when I was a kid where they all, they all like joined together and all these like furry gremlins from space joined together in a ball and roll around. But I always had it as a, like a, a gremlins knockoff and it was, it was the year after, at least a year after gremlins and ghostbusters. And so it plays on all those kinds of things. I hadn't seen let me double check that real quick actually, while I'm telling you that, because I, I don't know if I'm tell, if I'm um, getting the year right on that. Um, the original Critters film, 86. Okay, yeah, so it was a little bit after those. And yeah, it was, okay, riding the coattails of, um, of say, Gremlins and those kind of things. But man, oh man. It was absolutely enjoyable. It's funny. It's kind of scary at points. Well, almost scary at points. Um, and the writing is just really well done. Just like Night of the Creeps, every character has his or her moment. Except for Billy Zane, who gets killed pretty early. <laughs> but, you know, he's Billy Zane. He can he can take it. Um, every and it's some of the brilliant things about these kind of low budget movies maybe they haven't really got the plot sorted out quite right maybe they don't have the budget for amazing shots or amazing special effects uh so they rely they rely on um these moments in, with characters that I guess the writers, the directors really got and they wanted to let those characters have moments. And I think they got, you know, actors who were hungry to really give it their best on screen rather than casting, say, uh, a, a washed up star who just wants to cash the check in, which that can be cool as well. Sometimes I'm thinking of some excellent examples in which the star hadn't, I didn't want to do the movie and kind of only did it for cash. Donald Pleasance and Halloween or Kevin Bacon and Tremors and yet turn out brilliant performances. But he got hungry actors and great moments. And so at one point or another, every character gets a, a funny, a cool moment. There come up and they're, they're a real moment where they show who they are and they're more than just the side character. And Critters... Um, uh, I don't know. There was this. There was a side character that the filmmakers took seriously enough that he kind of took over the Critters franchise, uh, and it's this little. It's this little kind of um, um, Steinbeck character kind of thing. Like, uh, and his name's Charlie, and he's played by uh, Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you watch Critters, or if you know it, then you know the kind of joke I'm, I'm making there, um, and because it looks just because it looks just like him, actually. Um, 
and it's and so he ends up kind of taking over the film franchise critters 2 uh, the thing I guess I had seen as a kid, I definitely hadn't seen Critters 1 because it is just, it's a brilliant um, little you're stuck at the farmhouse and alien monsters are coming to attack you horror movie. Um, and Critters 2 gets a little bit more into the critters are attacking the whole town, so the whole town has to band together. It's pretty good. It's it's not Critters 1, but if you really enjoy Critters 1, like I think you will, check it out. Um, and then you can just skip to Critters Critters 4, which is surprisingly, uh, they 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 ran with uh, the success of Aliens, I think, in that one, and they make a pretty decent early 90s sci-fi movie. It's really well written with a little bit bigger budget. It's really shocking, and I think it kind of uh, fizzled out after that. Um, and then maybe you can go back and watch Critters 3. Um, my God, I, I didn't expect to be, I wanted this episode to be short. I said it was going to be short. I think we're a half hour into this thing. All right. Let me just throw out, mm, uh, let me just throw out a couple more unofficial screen monster awards from the monster professor of things I've checked out recently. Um, the, how about the uh, best invisible man? I'm not going to give it to invisible man. I'm going to give it to this surprisingly good uh, indie movie called Above the Shadows, which came out in 2019. Um, that one stars, I'm looking to find her name because I always forget her name. I just know her from as Anderson from Dread, Olivia Thurlby. Um, she starts feeling like she doesn't matter as a kid, especially after her mom dies and no one really pays attention to her. And so she fades and becomes invisible to everybody's view, everybody's memory of her ever existing, everybody's awareness of anything she even does. And it takes this premise, uh, just you have an invisible girl in the city, and it takes it extremely seriously. Well, what would you do if, it, I mean, if no one even, you couldn't like go get a job? Well, um, so she has to work online. <laughs> <laughs> because she has to send attachments of work through email because people can see email even though they can't see her. And so she becomes a paparazzi photographer and that she can sneak around and take pictures of people because they don't know. And so she's like this paparazzi parasitic journalist um, until she meets one the one guy in the whole planet who just happens to see her, happens to be a guy who's a uh, former celebrity whose life she had ruined with her paparazzi stuff and and it's a and it's a really it's a really bizarre film in that it mixes uh, a whole lot of things you would not expect like professional MMA even Tito Ortiz is is in it uh, who for the longest time was the uh, unstoppable light heavyweight champion in the UFC and by the way he um, I don't know if uh, some of these, some of these, uh, even light heavyweight, some of these professional fighters don't seem as big on screen as they are in real life. In real life, Tito Ortiz, he is, his skull was as big as a freaking hubcap. It looked like he's a damn giant. And, um, and, and I'm not sure he was, I mean, he wasn't very nice to me. I'm not sure he's a very nice guy. I'm way off track at this point. <laughs> he's good in the, he's really good in that film. He's a, I guess what's, it's funny to see him contrasted so much. He does look like a giant in this film, but he's like a really nice fella. Um, all these actors are really good. The writing is fantastic. It's a, it's a, um, I guess it's uh it's something that should be winning awards if it hasn't already and it takes this idea of in of the invisible man or the invisible girl uh really seriously as in okay try to live a life like that and every just about everything you would think of ends up coming through and um they explore that premise quite seriously and i always appreciate a movie like that let me throw out uh one more you know what 
I'll just mention this ever so briefly. Best witch in recent years goes to Miss Mari from season three of Preacher. She scared me to death and she's so well done. And they take this idea of what a witch would really be so seriously and it's so well done. Um, now, if you're not familiar with Preacher season one, season two, and you just jump straight into season three, I bet I bet it will be pretty, um, say, dizzying. <laughs> you won't really be able to tell what's going on because it's a pretty wild show. But I think I've talked about her before. So maybe I'll just slide past that really quickly and say... Um, I hadn't watched the new Halloween movie that from 2018 until just recently. And man, that is good. And it's really good. It quite clearly loves the original Halloween uh, as at least as much as I do. I guess more so since they made a whole movie that was kind of an homage to that. And it just treated all the other Halloween sequels as kind of... Uh, as non-existent folk tales and urban myths and it treated the first Halloween movie as the only true event in this story world and then it picks up many years later what is that 40 30, 40, many many years later and and it tries to to keep alive some of the great things that that original film does because the original Halloween, I've talked about it many times before, I'll just say that it is a feel-good movie. It really is. And there's nothing sad, bad, dark, or scary about it. it. It's as it's as pleasant as the great the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, in my household. You get to hang around this beautiful this beautiful this wonderful little town. Why well, I love it so much that I took that. You might be familiar with. Um, there's this popular board game, Jaws, based on Jaws. It's like a two to four player board game, and it's and it's really popular and it's a really cool kind of game system in which you're trying. One person plays the monster, the shark, Bruce, and then and then the others uh, play the other characters trying to track them down. Well, for Halloween, I just took, uh, I just ripped off those game system rules and I turned it into Halloween, <laughs> which the map is now Haddonfield. Instead of Jaws, you have the shape and then you have the characters in the first Halloween movie as the characters trying to track them down. Uh, that's how much I love the original Halloween. And full kudos to Halloween 2018. It gives you a great feel. It, it, it does all, it does right by the characters. It takes Michael Myers seriously. In fact, um, rather than a horror movie, a lot of the movie kind of functions as following Michael Myers on his quest to, to get Lori and, and kill her finally after all these years. And they do a fantastic job of making you root for him, but not in too much of a perverse way. Not in like a Rob Zombie kind of way exactly um not like a gross gritty terrible kind of uh, rooting for him um in fact they they it, it feels kind of something about it is pure and authentic and, and nice um they do it quite well so check out halloween 2018 and well Maybe, but I want to say more about Halloween 2 and Halloween 3 and Halloween 4 and all these kinds of things. Maybe we'll do that in a future episode because I'm coming up on 40 minutes and I planned on just talking only for like 15 minutes. So maybe, maybe I promise at some point in the future a whole episode in which I do nothing but run through what makes the Halloween movies great, where they have faltered in the sequels, where they did brilliant things in the sequels. Um, Maybe we'll just dedicate a whole episode to that in the future. For now, let me just say, I hope you enjoy this weather. I hope you enjoy this last week of Halloween if you're listening to this episode as soon as it comes out. In fact, I'm recording it right now, and I'm going to post it here in about an hour. And so if you're listening to it when it comes out, I just now recorded it. Um, and I hope I give you some really cool things, both retro and absolutely new, that you can watch and further enjoy Halloween. And so with that said, you survived another episode of The Monster Professor. 
I hope you enjoyed it and happy Halloween.